Well, hello there. Uh, today's chapter is going to be really short, so I figured I'd have some fun with it. Um, I guess some of the artists, they just don't have a lot to say about, which is weird. So today, happy Monday, by the way, try to keep this real weird. Um, we're returning with <laughs> artists and our pets for a short reading, but then I'm gonna do a little drawing activity, kind of killing two birds with one stone, because uh, I need to prepare my example for today's online art lesson. Um, so from artists and, the art, uh, <laughs> artists and their pets, we're gonna look at Franz Mark, Seeing the World Through Animals' Eyes. Franz Mark was born in 1880 in Munich, Germany. He always loved animals, and he showed promise as an artist. He joined the Munich Academy of Art when he was 20. After completing his training, he painted horses, dogs, cats, monkeys, cows, and other animals in bright colors and distorted shapes. And you see him with his uh, painting and some lovely animals hanging out with him. Don't judge me. This is what COVID-19 quarantine is doing to me. Oh, my shirt's showing. <laughs> he believed that animals were the only innocent creatures in a damaged world, and his paintings of them expressed his feelings about the world leading up to World War I. In 1903, six months in Paris, studying Impressionist and Post-Impressionist paintings, and after returning to Germany, he studied animal anatomy so he could draw them accurately before distorting them in his paintings. He spent hours at the Berlin Zoo, studying and sketching the animals from all angles. His animals were recognizable, but they also symbolized his view of life through angled shapes and vivid colors. And there you see him at the zoo. So that's something to think about if you go to the zoo a lot with your family. It'd be great to bring a sketchbook and just sit and chill with a, one of your favorite animals and try drawing them from every angle every time they move. Mark used color symbolically. For him, blue was spiritual, yellow was happy and gentle, and red was angry and heavy. He and his friend, Vasily Kandinsky, started an art artist group called Der Blaue Reiter, the Blue Writer. Everyone in the group was invited to be expressive, and we learned about Der Blaue Writer earlier with, oh, who was it? Oh, someone else. <laughs> A plus to you if you remember. Okay, my green screen is falling off of me here. Let's see if we can keep this to work. <laughs> In about 1911, Mark painted his pet dog, Ruthie. He also painted several cats sleeping or grooming themselves. Their poses seem so natural that it is likely he had pets too. In 1914, he bought a house in Austria where he lived with his wife, his dog Ruthie, possibly cats, and a tame deer. Mm, that's why there's a deer on that page. Mm. And then here you see his dog Ruthie chillaxin, and here below also with a cat. He expressed the world as seen through animals' eyes. And in 1915, he wrote an essay, How Does a Horse See the World? He wrote, Is there a more mysterious idea for an artist than how to ima imagine how nature is reflected in the eyes of the animal? And that's where the story ends. It's a very short chapter, that one. So... I'm going to go back into my green screen cave and I'll see you in a couple minutes where I'm going to do a demonstration of a drawing of a contemporary artist, Okuda San Miguel from Madrid, Spain. Madrid. All right. But this looks really cool.
So here are a few more images from Franz Marc just to fill the gap since that chapter was a little bit shorter. And looking at Franz Marc's work, I'm automatically, my mind goes to a contemporary artist named Okuda Sem Miguel, who we'll look at in just a moment. Um, but the way that Franz divided up his page um, and broke it into simple shapes, I thought would be beneficial to compare to the art of Acuda San Miguel, who lives and works in Barcelona. So I'm borrowing some information about Acuda San Miguel from streetartbio.com, as well as from justkidsofficial.com. Um, but basically, Acuda was, or is from Madrid, and he has a very iconographic language of multicolored geometric structures and patterns in his art, which is mostly street art that can be found on the streets, railroads, abandoned factories, and all around the globe, um, whether on canvas, a wall, or a giant sculpture. His work can be classified as pop surrealism, um, and of course street art or urban art composed of geometric prints and multicolored um, structures that blend in with the body of organic forms like animals or people or nature. And he began his career as a street artist in 96, around that time, but since then his work has obviously developed more and has been shown all over the world. And when I look at it, I see that connection to Franz Marc, whether or not that was an influence, but just breaking down the space into those sort of geometric shapes. Um, there's such a strong similarity, as well as the bright and vivid colors. So I hope you enjoy his work, as that is what is going to inspire our um, drawing uh, today. So uh, what we are going to do is draw our own animal, and you can draw the same one as me as if you like, uh, and uh, break it up into his style. And I'm doing a puma because that is Nebinger's mascot, and I started just by making two circles, one for the head and one for the nose, um, to help guide me, and you see the nose circle is kind of a little bit lower there. And I'm just going to speed up the process of me drawing this. Um, and then we'll come back to how I'm going to break up the space. But you could draw any animal and uh, kind of come back, pause the video, and come back as I, uh, when I come back to break up the spaces. I'm being a little redundant there. Sorry about that. All right, now I'm gonna take a permanent marking pin. I'm just using my Micron, uh, Sakura Micron pin, but you can use a Sharpie or anything else that um, won't dissolve in water um, so that when it's dry, it's a permanent mark. And I'm just gonna outline everything, add in a few other details and lines and maybe some whiskers and such. So I'll also speed up this part. And we are all drawn or traced with marker. And uh, not a necessary step, but I just like to have that black outline to help guide me. But if you look at uh, Akuda's work, it doesn't, not everything has that black outline. His, his, everything's just defined by the color itself. Um, but this is just my own personal preference. And then I go through with an eraser and erase my pencil lines, um, trying to just try to get them all gone as best I can get rid of the pencil shavings, and then we are ready to think about color. I got a little anxious grabbing my markers there. Um, but the next step is to uh, break up the space into geometric shapes. You could do your own uh, geometric patterning if you want. If you want to be more controlled, you could get a ruler and grid it out and break up the squares into triangles or keep it with squares. Or maybe you want to think about the shape you use. You don't have to do it the same way that um, Okuda San Miguel does. Um, but what I notice about his work, what I'm trying to 
mimic somewhat is uh, he has mostly triangular shapes. Um, every now and then you see squares or maybe just lines, but I see mostly triangles, which makes me happy. Triangle is my favorite shape. Um, so that is what I'm going to try to break mine into. On some of his work, you might have noticed some lines that are like curved and then those curved lines are broken into triangles, which is also fine. You could rewind and look at maybe the one of the lion for that example. Um, but the way I do it, I just start drawing lines. Sometimes those lines come off organically from where, say, the corner of his eye ended, or like I'm doing now, where the tip of his nose is. And then I just start breaking them into triangles, and then my triangles grow off of other triangles. I'm dividing the spaces that it, the I'm dividing each space up into triangles, which means that I'm taking one space and breaking it down into smaller spaces. And I'm not, I'm not being too thoughtful about where I'm putting the triangles. I'm just trying to do it um, in a way that I like, that pleases me when I look at it. So that's why I see my pencil, like take it away every now and then and I look at what I'm doing. Um, to see if I'm happy with that. And if I can make a way to emphasize a certain area like the eyes, I will um, find a way to break that shape up a little bit more. Um, looking at the nose, I wasn't happy how big a space that is, so I went in and divided it, just trying to keep everything as triangular as possible. Now doing his larger body, breaking that space up. I said shape, <laughs> but you know what I mean. Breaking that up into more triangles um, and this won't take me much longer and then we're going to get into the coloring part. For the coloring you are using um, water-based markers. You could use permit markers or whatever you have, could even be crayons, but what I'm going to be doing today for my online lesson has to do with water-based markers so I'm working on this example for that. Um, so I'm going to be using water-based markers so I can show you both coloring in solid and how to use water and uh, a paintbrush with it to make it become more painterly, um, especially if your markers are drying out. This technique works really well to kind of give a little bit more life to that marker before you have to get rid of it. And side note to that, don't ever just throw markers in the trash. You can send them back to Crayola. Any kind of marker doesn't even have to be their brand and they're going to recycle it. So what I noticed here, this marker is dried out and there's like a gunk built up on the tip. So I'm going to go rinse it and give it a little bit more life. And you're going to see how vivid it still is. It's going to be... It still has life. Just when it gets that weird dried chunk, I don't know why it does that, but it does that. And look at that, I rinsed off the tip, wiped off the gunk, and look how bright it is. It might dry out again in a day, but a little splash of water will reinvigorate it. So since this one's so saturated and beautiful, I'm just going to go ahead and color in that whole ear. And that's something I've noticed with um, San Miguel's. The ears tend to kind of just stay the shape of the ear. And then I would go in and start coloring other spaces that I want to be that same color. And if you've had art class with me in real life, you know that I like to outline the area that I'm about to color in. I call that my color force field because it helps me not go beyond that line. And so if I wanted anything else red, I would go and color in other parts red. So I would do all of my red all at once. Um, but uh, I'm just going to do a little bit because I'm not going to finish this for the video. I'm going to finish it during my live demonstration today. So now I have my paintbrushes in water, <clears throat> excuse me, and I'm going to start coloring another one in. And what you're going to notice with this um, particular marker, it is a little dried out. I'm not getting those uh, juicy marks that I did with the red. That's okay. I'm going to take my paintbrush, dip it in some water, just plain old clean water, and apply it right on top of that marker, and it acts as if it were watercolor on the paper and smooths out real, real nicely. And then it gets more of a painter look or just like a nice solid coloring. Here's another option that you can also do. Um, I think I, oh, I do go back to the orange, I forgot. I think I do the exact same thing just to show you again. <clears throat> 
him. You can see with this one especially how much my marker is dying. So I get the water and I, I do this quickly while the, the marker is still wet on the paper because it blends better. You can do it after, but you might still see those marker lines. So if I do it while it's still wet, it's going to blend more successfully. All right, now I'm going to show you um, a different way which could be cool. You could do your drawing where your shapes are all um, like a thick saturated color, um, or you can try to make it have a more painterly look. So I'm just gonna do the border in purple, and then I'm gonna take my paintbrush, get the border wet so that can start um, dissolving or spreading out, kind of activating the color, if you will. And I'm going to spread some of that color into the middle section of that shape, but I'm not going to try to blend it all together. I'm going to keep it with that darker outline and lighter in the middle. So just because we are inspired by an artist doesn't mean we have to do it just like them. San Miguel's shapes were solidly colored in. Franz Marc used paint also, but he had a more painterly, abstracted look um, with lots of different values, especially if you look at the one with the blue horse that I showed you earlier. Um, there are lots of different values of blue, value being white to dark. So you could incorporate these two styles of it together, or you could make it all your own. Um, so you see I did that there again, but to, another way you could make it all your own is maybe you fill in each of those shapes with a different pattern. This is your art. The artists give us an inspiration or a jumping point for what we can do, and then it's up to you to make it your own. But you definitely don't want to copy their work on its own. All right. Um, <laughs> that's it. See you guys soon. Um, oh, you know what? I'm going to say one more thing, and that's just a couple of tips about watercoloring. And I'll throw up a nice picture here in the background just uh, to fill the, the gap of space. But when coloring with water um, or watercolor in general, you don't want to put wet next to wet. So you're probably going to jump around with the water and that's fine. Give the paper a little bit of time to dry. Um, and that's really, that's the biggest thing I want to say about this. All right. Have fun. Miss you guys.